people are really afraid of raising prices. And I think it was Mark Andreessen, you know, who said, a lot of problems go away if you can raise your prices. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to the Impact Pricing Podcast, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the lifelong relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and my mission is to help your company win more business at higher prices. And helping us do that today is our guest, Paul Orlando. Here are three things you want to know about Paul before we start. He is the founder of Startups Unplugged that builds incubator programs inside companies. This is going to be fun to talk about. He recently wrote a book called Growth Units, Learn to Calculate Customer Acquisition Cost, Lifetime Value, and Why Businesses Behave the Way They Do. I don't believe he answers that last question. I don't think anybody does, but that's okay. And he's an adjunct professor and runs the incubator at USC. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Mark. It's really good to be here. It's going to be fun. I normally start out with how did you get into pricing, but I, I wouldn't say you're in pricing. Uh, how did you get into incubators? I guess we'll start there. Um, no, fair question. And I will chime in on the pricing uh, one a little later, but I got into incubators because I had the experience of first early in my career working in a big corporate environment, but then actually founding or co-founding a, a startup in New York that I ran for a couple of years and I managed to make most of the make mistakes possible, you know, in, in the couple of years that I was doing that. And as I was figuring things out, I was looking around and I had a lot of other friends who were starting startups back then. And I became really fascinated in that process that founders go through, like in figuring things out or usually not figuring things out. So um, I specifically got into running incubators and accelerators because um, I was running a like a found, founder roundtable series in New York, something I was doing on the side, enjoyed you know, doing that, and I wanted to make it a bigger part of what I did. So I looked for a new market to go into where I thought I could build a startup accelerator of some type. Um, that's how I ended up you know, going to Hong Kong and building the first startup accelerator there, which was uh, a great experience. This is back 2012, uh, 2013. And since then, I've kind of made that my focus area. So I've done, um, you know, four external programs of this type and then a bunch of internal ones for corporates, but um, really enjoy working with groups of entrepreneurs, whether they are external, independent or in-house and kind of sharing my experiences with them and just building a community around that. I think that's pretty fascinating. Now I've worked with several external incubators and accelerators. I've advised them and, and it's fun. But what I find really fascinating is the idea that you build incubators or accelerators inside companies. So describe one for us, just so that we all get a feel for what this looks like. Sure, I'll, I'll talk about a CPG company, a consumer packaged goods company that I was helping uh, a while back. So big company, you know, they have their thousands of products on store shelves, or you could buy them online, uh, many recognizable brands. And in-house, a lot of talent, a lot of expertise on the R&D side, on the marketing side, sales side, uh, logistics. And even so, you know, their experience is when it comes to a new product being launched, most of the time it doesn't really work out. It doesn't live up to the expectations that they had or the business model that they had built for it or the business case, I should say. So um, the question then becomes, well, what can we try to play with to improve our odds of success? And so the model that I worked with them and that, I'll, that I typically work with um, existing organizations on is taking that in-house expertise that you have, but kind of changing the way that you work. So rather than going from a concept to customer uh, with a timeline of 18 to 24 months, which might be typical for that type of a product company, trying to shorten that down a lot, but run multiple iterations or like try to spin out multiple products. Whereas in the past, you might be working on just one with that same team. So as an example, 
Um, I worked with a team that was working on a new, um, it was a new cleaning product in one situation, or they, they had a, a bunch of those that they were working on and they had expertise in that area. Not at all my expertise, but they had done all sorts of R&D in that area and you know, they had their labs. They really understood what people were using their products for. And they were uh, trying to work on a, you know, another product. And so rather than go through that, you know, that legacy model where, you know, concept, spin up the team, 18, 24 months later, you're on store shelves. Instead, we ended up working on multiple iterations of that type of a problem set. So they came up with a few different potential products. We then tested them um, in the market off brand. So they didn't want to take that brand risk, but we ended up testing them. And from that, they ended up understanding, okay, what are people really doing or, or what are our customers doing that's maybe outside of our, uh, our knowledge today? Are they looking for other ways to solve a cleaning specific problem? If so, how can we solve that for them? If so, how should we be reaching them? You know, in other words, what's the distribution like? How should that product be formulated? How should we express it? Like all of those things that kind of go into that, you can test those things before you have spun up the entire team and spent two years working on it. So that's the kind of thing that, that I end up doing. Yeah, the thing that keeps running through my mind as you were describing all these were fail fast, right? I want to get rid of those bad ideas quickly. And, and, and I'd love to go back and just for kicks, because it makes me think, why is it that if I'm going to spend two years developing a product with really smart people, it still fails? And, and I find that fascinating. And my it, gut says it's because people are afraid to let go once they've made the commitment it's like we gotta we gotta see this through um is there is there something else that you see that is a big part of it because imagine you've already gotten the budget right? you've spun up the team and so if this is what you expect to be a two-year process in month six if you start having this feeling of i think maybe we're we're on the wrong track you know what do you do do you really shut everything down early? You know, you've already hired people or you've, you've pulled people in from other parts of the organization. So it's really difficult once you've already committed those resources. Um, so when it comes to that term, fail fast, I actually, I don't want people to fail fast. I don't want them to fail slow either, but I'd rather that they succeed fast or second best, succeed slow. So I'd like to say, learn early, learn often, rather than fail fast, because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get people to, learn early in other words encounter the customer upfront rather than downstream and learn often keep that process going like you really probably have not figured everything out just yet you need to keep iterating you know there's so much that you could test you know before you have committed serious resources yeah, I think that's a fair statement. But uh, by the way, you just insulted the host. I just want to point that out. No, you didn't. it's fine. <laughs> Edit that part out. Edit that part out. Yeah. No, never. Okay. So you originally sent me an email saying, Hey, I think your listeners want to hear about lifetime value. And I've got to say, I don't think anybody wants to hear about lifetime value. Are you kidding but, me? What? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> but um, I actually, in my newest book, Win Keep Grow, I had a whole page on how to calculate lifetime value. Now, you wrote a whole book on how to calculate lifetime value. So I'm guessing I missed a few things. Tell me what it is you think I missed or give me the high level of lifetime value and why you find this so fascinating. Well, I'm, I'm probably just a wordier writer, that's all. <laughs> so um, so I, in, this, in this book, Growth Units, this is something that I actually put together for a class that I teach at the University of Southern California. And um, I used to, and this class is focused on lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. And uh, and I bring startups into the class and they, you know, the students in teams work with these startups on one element of their growth. Now, um, I used to do all of this live at the whiteboard and we would kind of derive formulas, you know, together live and, you know, look at a conversion funnel and try to figure out what lifetime value is or what a payback period is you know, uh, it, it, and on and on for different companies. When everything went remote, that stopped working so well for me, you know, because um, I kind of had that really interactive in-person uh, style of teaching. So when it all went remote, I decided, 
let me just try to write all this stuff down. And what I ended up discovering was, um, I, at least hearing from other people, I had, you know, I had put together something that was useful to them in figuring things out. So um, the reason that I think it took a whole book, it's a short book, but that it, that it took more than um, you know, a few pages for me anyway, was there are so many ways to look at this question of what lifetime value is or what customer acquisition cost is. So I, I break it into the components. So for me, LTV, there's a pricing component, there's a cost component, and there's a retention component. You can play with any of those things, but if you play with one of them, it's probably going to impact the other two in some way. So um, the reason that I actually reached out to you, even though I'm not a pricing expert, is thinking about pricing is so important and I see so few people actually do it. In fact, like one of the things that I love doing and I, I do on a regular basis in my incubators or even in my classes, I will bring a pricing expert in to talk about like the, the way that they have you know, um, uh, researched a demand curve or they've done like you know, a pricing sensitivity meter you know, uh, for clients of theirs or, the, or the, you know, like the ways that they test you know, uh, pricing. Because what I typically see startups do anyway, not necessarily bigger organizations, but startups, I typically see them use some type of a cost plus kind of a model. Well, you know, here's how much our costs are, we mark it up, you know, whatever percent, or they just look around and they see, okay, our competitor is pricing $10 a month, let's also do that. That seems to be the right answer. Um, or, of course, they are guided into uh, the model of, well, it has to be free because you need to like, you know, get the biggest market possible. You've got to grow really fast. So of course it has to be free and that's the right answer. Now, you know, something magical has to happen so that in the future you, you, know, you do end up making money in some way. Um, so in this growth units book, I'd like kind of picking apart those, you know, those different uh, models and seeing how companies either did figure things out or did not figure things out and how they get you know, like you know skewed in different directions maybe unintentionally for them um so uh one of the examples that i give and this is probably something that like all of your listeners know about is so a few years ago we had that um you know the big news from that company uh, movie pass where they were they had been around um i think they started maybe in 2011 but around 2018, they had this uh, new offer, $9.95 per month. You could go see a movie a day in a theater. And it got a ton of press because, well, it was a ridiculous type of offer, right? How could it possibly be so cheap? And people were speculating, oh, there must be some deal with the theaters or they're getting you know, they're, they're, they're getting some commission from uh, concession sales, something like that. Well, the reality was the management of that company had an agreement where if they were able to sign up 150,000 additional subscribers, they got this sizable bonus. Well, they got the bonus because they hit that 150,000 new subscriber number in, in two days. And they thought it was going to take a year. They got it in two days. That's having a customer acquisition cost of zero. It's all word of mouth. It's just too good to be true. I better sign up for this, you know, and like start watching movies every day. And what they had used was some assumptions around pricing um, that didn't really make sense for the average population. So they thought, hey, in general, people only see four or five movies a year, even if we're paying full price, which they were back to the movie theaters, we more than cover our costs. Even if people double the number of movies they see a year, we cover our costs. Um, and of course, what ends up happening is with 995 a month, you attract the people who are like the movie fanatics. Like they are seeing you know, five movies a month or you know, 10 movies a month, or you would now encourage people to see even more. So as a result, that's an example, I, I think, where you know, if they were thinking of lifetime value, the whole thing falls apart. Their assumptions really held no water. And that was something where, you know, they went so aggressive on price that yes, they did sign up a ton of people, but it also drove the business, you know, under. So, so let me push back on something for just a second. I love the entire story until at the very end when you said, if they were focused on lifetime value, they wouldn't have made these decisions. 
and I'm not sure that's true. What I think the real mistake was what you pointed out earlier, and that was they didn't understand what their costs really were going to be. So if, if it was true that people only saw four or five movies a year, they were charging 10 bucks a month, lifetime value looks great, with zero customer acquisition cost, hey, this is, a, this is a phenomenal business. So it was really the misunderstanding of the cost. True, but that's one part of lifetime value. So in other words, if from the perspective of MoviePass, they have 995 of revenue coming in, but their costs going out are multiples of that because in their model, you know, as it was set up, they had to pay full ticket price back to the theater for having one of their guests show up. Yeah, and, and so the, impl the implication of the story that you're sharing is they should have calculated this lifetime value before they launched their business. And what I see lots and lots of companies doing is launching products and then using churn rates to calculate expected lifetime values. Is that incorrect or, or how, how do you look at this? So no, you are right in the sense that lifetime value is not something that you can really get a full picture of until you've been out for a while. Um, I guess my point on MoviePass was that their assumptions just had to be off like a tiny bit for the entire thing to fall apart. If you're building instead, say, a, also a subscription business where, you know, even if we have this expected rate of churn and, you know, there's drop off, we know that, you know, we're paying back on the customer acquisition costs in a few months. As long as we can keep people that length of time, we're good. Um, and we can probably improve on that rate of churn, you know, so we can you know, shorten the payback period. This movie pass example is one where like, they would need to only attract the people who did not see movies <laughs> in order for it to work, which was the, the strange thing about that. Like you, you provide value, but you want the people who actually don't want the value as customers. Um, I guess that was my, my, my I, comparison there. Yeah. I think that was spot on and, and they messed up their pricing metric. They were charging for the wrong things. So I, I think you're absolutely right with that. Let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, pricing and lifetime value, because it looks like you see this a lot. And one of the things that I see in many, many super successful companies is they come out with a low price. And I don't know that they do that because they think they're trying to uh, penetrate the market or they just think that's how much value they have in their product. And then over the course, as they become more successful over the course of several years, the price, you know, 10 X's. I mean, it's hugely higher than it was when they first launched. Um, and, and so do you see that as a mistake, a strategy, or just the way the business evolves? Ooh, maybe all three of those. Yes. <laughs> so, um, there's, I mean, there are certainly many examples of companies, say, even if it is intentional, companies that think, oh, this is, this is the model that we'll use, we'll go out free or very close to free, and then we'll inch the prices up. But do they actually survive that long, right? Um, if price is some metric of value or some measure of value, you know, you, you want to be able to charge, you know, something you don't necessarily want a business that has to push prices as low as possible. You know, I, I always think of, um, you know, some of the pricing experts I've gotten to know, you know, over the years, like showing me how, well, if you move prices low in some situations, you actually have less demand because you're now, you're, you're basically telling people this thing is not very good. And I always like, you know, mentally, I always, you know, think of the image of, say you want to buy you know, a car, some nice type of car or whatever, Mercedes, Tesla. And somebody says, you know, I have something It's you know, it's that kind of a quality and it only costs hundred dollars. You would think this is this is ridiculous. Like this, it's a, it's a lemon. Like you know, stay away from me. So we're kind of we're we're trying to do these two different things. We've you know we've both trained people that they should be thinking about the lowest price possible, at least in a startup, you know, mentality. But their customers might interpret this very differently. Um, also, it becomes very different if you're doing something that's more consumer facing versus enterprise facing. Um, but, uh, you can learn a lot by like running an experiment. Like I, I'm not sure if you've talked about this or looked at this, but, um, a couple of economists a few years back got access to Uber's 
um, pricing data and how, you know, Uber will basically change its price based on, you know, certainly location, but also time of day. If there is bad weather, you know, they have that surge pricing and on and on. So many variations. They got access to um, Uber's, uh, you know, uh, you know, pricing data and they were, they were able to actually draw the demand curve, you know, for them with, you know, which is something that you don't actually normally see. Like you might see that in a textbook. You don't actually typically see that for a company. And even then they discovered Uber is underpricing. Like they could be charging a lot more during these surge pricing events. They underprice. And so here's the question, like why would a big company like that, you know, do that? If they, in theory, you know, they see people are willing to pay more. Why are they paying less? And so this is the other the other piece of pricing, which kind of ties back uh, to some of these other examples, you have this just like this public opinion uh, effect. So Uber had a lot of bad press about you know charging whatever five x, ten x during big storms that happened around the country in past years. Maybe you don't actually want to push it as far as you could go. Uh, maybe you actually want to back off in some cases. That's another extreme example. For the most part, these startups, I think, um, tend to underprice. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Um, one of the things that I found pretty fascinating as I started diving into studying subscriptions and, and thinking about lifetime value is these concepts that we emphasize because we're doing subscriptions actually make a lot of sense in non-subscription businesses. So when you start thinking of lifetime value, Uber is not a subscription, right? Uber is right. truly, a, I'm going to buy something and use it. And so if they upset me, if they make me mad, I'll punish them by not using them again. Yep. And so the lifetime value could still be that, hey, it's, it's better for them to underprice because they keep me as a customer all the time, as opposed to getting the most from me in that, during that storm. Um, no, that, that's a great point. And that's why you're right. Uber is not a subscription. And so based on the type of business you have, you have to take that into consideration. And, and I'd even, I guess I'd even say, you know, subscription businesses themselves are different. Like there are some subscriptions that are, are about, uh, you know, trying to maximize customer retention. <clears throat> so that might be, you know, um, Dollar Shave Club, right? Uh, which like started out like, to me, like, why on earth would I want to get this delivered? This is something that's, you know, I, I know how to buy razors and you know shaving cream. Um, why would it, why on earth would this you know be something I wanted to get delivered? Now all of a sudden I have predictability. You know I get you on a um, you know, a monthly delivery. I can estimate how long you're going to be. You know, after a while I can estimate how long you're going to be a customer of mine. I have predictability rather than you know one month I might have more people coming in and buying my products you know versus the next. But there's also subscription businesses, or I'll say. They function like subscription businesses, but they really do something else. And that's the ones that are about um, removing fixed costs or turning fixed costs into variable costs, I'll say. So this might be something like Amazon Web Services. You know, uh, previously, you know, for my hosting or, or other you know, computing you know, services, I buy the servers, I set them up in racks, right? You know, I, I you know, position, I collocate them in a data center. And I have that upfront fixed cost. Uh, you know, the team that you know operates that. I use something like AWS, and I turn all that upfront fixed cost into a variable cost that you know goes month to month. And there again, you get plugged into something like that. You know, you don't want to go back to the old days. You know, um, that that would be like pretty painful making a change. So, um, yeah, the, yeah these I would. Changes. I, yeah, I would think of those as frequent recurring revenue type businesses, mm -hmm. right? I think anytime you have this recurring revenue, you could treat it like a subscription. Yep. But now, now I'll play another one by you. That's the exact same thing, but it doesn't feel the same. I used to drink a ton of diet Coke. Is that a massively recurring revenue stream? And could they have treated that like a subscription, even though it wasn't a subscription? Yeah. So in other words, could they have treated that like a subscription as in they just send you a case every month? That's sure, or...
or they find some way to track my usage so they could actually figure out what's my customer lifetime value and, and all the things we talk about when we think of subscriptions and recurring revenue businesses. Uh, yeah, that's a great example because I, I've been wondering the same thing, like as in if there was some way to track who does buy <laughs> that unit of Coke um, and then or even like, you know, do they finish the can or bottle like, you know, do they give it to somebody else or, or are they the one drinking it? Um, that might be a failure of just being able to track something like that. But I, I could see, you know, a company like Coke trying to figure something like that uh, out in the future. It's also an example of a company that has uh, like the true margins on a can of Coke are really high, right? It costs, I mean, it's water, some sugar, you know, secret formula stuff, you know, in quotes and, you know, the, the cost of the can is actually greater than the cost of the ingredients in there. Um, and that's why a business like that can spend so much on marketing. Like they, they spend like, you know, uh, I don't know the numbers, but a crazy amount, you know, just on reminding people about, you know, uh, these products. Um, and they can do that because, you know, the, the margins on, you know, on each can are, are, are so big. Yeah. It's so I love having these conversations because they cause me to think of things I never thought of before. So, so I love Diet Coke as in, I used to buy it all the time. It really was recurring revenue. Uber, I could buy all the time or AWS, I could buy all the time. But the difference is Uber and AWS can track me. Yeah. They know what decisions I'm making, how much I'm buying, what I'm doing. And Coke can't today. Mm -hmm. And and it may be that's why they never said, hey, let's treat this like a subscription or like a recurring revenue or or what's Mark's lifetime value for buying Diet Coke. Um, pretty, pretty interesting. Yes. Yeah. No. yeah. OK, so what else am I missing in lifetime value? When I um, talk to people about it, I I often just try to understand how they are thinking about it. So the typical uh, issue that I have is often when I ask people like what their lifetime value is for their startup, their company, and they actually tell me a number. So um, the reason that I have an issue with that is it once you really dig in, it's never one number. First of all, if you're giving me one number, that's like the average of all your customer segments and like how how like you know different users are you know uh, actually using your product. So once you dig in a bit, you probably can segment out and you could say well. This segment, it's you know hundred dollars. This other one is you know like five hundred. This one, it's only ten dollars. You can actually go into some specificity about that. You can also then talk about how those segments, or how you might be able to grow each of those segments. Some might be able to grow by word of mouth. Some it might be paid acquisition. You know, some you might need a like uh, a sales team. You know, uh, to actually you know uh, bring customers on. Um, and then I also like to go into well rather than just one number, even if you have one number for each of those segments, what are the sequence of flows that happen? So I, I you know, in the book, you know, I, I talk of L, uh, LTV as a river. So you don't get it all up front, typically anyway. It's, you know, you're getting this through repeat customer interactions over time. So I like to model it out. Typically just a simple way of doing that is in a spreadsheet format. So you can see, okay, do I have to, in some cases, do I have to commit to some amount of time of I'm giving stuff away for free? And so this might be, say, a freemium model. Maybe I have a free product that uh, or a free option that people can use. There might be some cost to me, but I'm willing to eat that cost for a while because I know some percent of people will upgrade to the premium version and then the payback period is, you know, such and such a time. Um, but actually model that out. And the reason is like, I you could have a what seems to be a favorable LTV or favorable LTV to CAC ratio, but if you don't model it out, you might have a situation like this one. Say, oh, it costs us ten dollars to acquire a customer, lifetime value is fifty dollars. It's great, but you model it out, and with the timing, you discover that well, we only actually collect all that fifty dollars after three years. Like maybe you're out of business. You pay the ten dollars up front, and it takes you three years to get fifty dollars back. You might have already shut down by that point, or it's constricting how you can grow. So 
that's another you know, way I like to work with startups or at least like to dive in and help them understand, you know, these ratios that you hear about or like the numbers that you hear about, um, they can be, be misleading unless you actually like start digging in a bit. Nice. I get annoyed by saying LTV over CAC all the time. And so uh, I actually named it the viability metric. Hmm. So are you viable as a company or not? And, uh, and so what number do you use to indicate viability? So there are, so I've ended up kind of staying away from those numbers. So there are these rules of thumb and you typically see that uh, three to one, four to one kind of ratio for LTV to CAC. Um, that all goes out the window if it's a timing issue. In other words, if it takes a really long time to get the payback. So to me, the the better way is actually, once you have the data, try to model out that sequence of flows, as in every month, this is what we're spending you know, on serving that customer. Uh, we know what we spent up front to acquire them, if it was anything. Um, and then we eventually know how much um, the margin we're getting back in return. Um, but it takes some time to get to that point. Yeah, it sounds like you almost prefer the payback time as the metric to, to use as opposed to the LTV over CAC. Uh, I, I would prefer that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Because that tells you a bit more. Like, um, for example, um, related see, to this, whoop, related to this is uh, hardware companies have, um, you know, traditionally they've been constricted in how they can grow because they have to buy components, they have to do assembly, they build inf you know, inventory, and only then they can sell the thing. And then somebody buys it and then finally they get paid, you know, based on whatever the terms with their you know, uh, you know, payment processor are. And months can, can go by, like easily four months can go by, you know, between when they actually spent on, you know, building up the inventory to when they get paid. And that's a reason that traditionally constricts the growth of hardware companies. So if you can start to either shorten that time, taking pre-orders, for example, or if there's something that you can do with your own supply chain, uh, tough today, but if there's something that you could do there, um, you could you could improve your odds of being able to like use customer revenue to grow. But um, but you know, payback period, you know, when it comes to CAC and LTV, I I do like better. It's getting you, I think, a little closer to something that's actionable. In general, I just like modeling out the whole thing. Yep. Nice. Nice. Paul, I think we could talk for another hour, but we are out of time. I have to ask you the final question though. What's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Raise prices. Oh my God. How true is that? <laughs> Gosh, so few people realize that and they're terrified of it. It's true. No, people are really afraid of raising prices. And I think, I think it was Mark Andreessen, you know, who said, a lot of problems go away if you can raise your prices. So I hope between listening to your podcast and you know reading your work that people can sort that out and figure out how to raise their own prices. I, I think that's, uh, that, that's possibly the best answer to that question I've ever gotten. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm uh, P Orlando, I believe is my, uh, you know, uh, ID, but Paul Orlando, you can look me up, um, on Twitter, P Orlando also. And if you like, uh, check out that book growth units about lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. All right. Episode 159 is all done. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? They're very valuable to us. And if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.